This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you so much for the really kind and extensive introduction. I maybe don't even need to give my talk now. Um, can everybody hear me all right in the back with the mic? It's working. Cool. All right. So it's my pleasure to be here today. And thank you guys all for taking time out of your schedule to come and listen to me talk about my science. And yeah, I'm excited to share a bit about my empirical work on resurrection plants and also some of this emerging work on looking at inequities in plant science. So I've divided my talk today into two parts. I'm gonna begin, maybe spend the first 20 or 25 minutes talking about um, the empirical work I'm doing studying resurrection plants, uh, primarily in South Africa. And then I'm gonna shift gears completely for the second part of the talk and discuss our recent work on quantifying and describing some inequities in plant science. Okay, let me actually see if I can get rid of this little thing. There we go. I thought I might start out by giving a little bit of background about myself, uh, just so you have a sense of where I came from and, and more or less how I arrived where I am today. So I grew up in New Hampshire, not all that far from here, and I spent my teenage years working on small scale vegetable farms. And this gave me a real appreciation for plants and plant production systems. And I actually thought I would have a career in, in agriculture and in farming, but it didn't take me long to realize that that work is extremely hard um, physically. And so I, I sort of veered away from that. And during my 20s, I had the opportunity to travel quite extensively. Uh, some of these travels were supported through uh, my schooling and my research activities. But uh, most of them were actually really in pursuit of my uh, rock climbing hobby. So not academic at all, but these travels took me to some really amazing and far flung places in the world. And one of the things that, that really stood out to me as I was traveling was just how widespread and devastating the effects of drought were in many of the regions that I visited. And so, this, in addition to realizing that farming was really hard work, uh, led me back to academia, and I started uh, working on a PhD in plant science. And my work has really been centered around, all right. So my work has really been centered around this question of how can we make the most out of an increasingly arid world? So not only is drought a problem today or 10 years ago when I was traveling and making these observations, but as you all, I think, appreciate, drought is predicted to increase in many of the food producing regions of the world in the coming decades. And now I think there's a lot of ways that we can and should think about answering this question or optimizing sustainability and food security in an increasingly arid world. And all of these approaches should be pursued in parallel. That being said, the approach that I've decided to um, focus on for the time being is to understand the biology of organisms that are naturally adapted to thrive in arid biomes, and that we can then leverage this understanding for some of our own applied objectives, whether that be uh, engineering more drought resilient crops or improving management strategies for arid habitats, or even understanding how to preserve tissues in a dry state rather than in a frozen state. So I'm a plant biologist, and I think many of you guys are. So if we look to the natural world, we see, um, this really doesn't want to advance. <laughs> we see a number of natural adaptations that have evolved across the plant kingdom to cope with drought. Um, some of these you're gonna be very familiar with, seeds or succulents are very success successful strategies for dealing with periods of water scarcity. But the adaptation that really um, piqued my interest is that of desiccation tolerance. Desiccation tolerance is pictured in these three GIFs at the top, and it allows these vegetative tissues of, of these plants to survive um, nearly the complete dehydration of their tissues. They can persist in this dry and dormant state for months to years on end, 
but they rehydrate and resume normal photosynthesis and metabolism within hours to days of rewetting. Plants with this ability in their vegetative tissues are sort of commonly referred to as resurrection plants because of their ability to quote unquote resurrect from what looks like a dead and dormant state. So this is a really beautiful and fascinating adaptation. And as I mentioned previously, there's a lot of potential applications for this for some of our own sort of human centric uh, goals. So desiccation tolerance in plants has a long and interesting evolutionary history. It's thought to have evolved around 500 million years ago and was critical in facilitating the transition out of the aquatic environment and into the terrestrial environment by early land plants. Throughout evolutionary time, desiccation tolerance was lost in the vegetative tissues of most vascular plants, but it was retained in most seeds. And then vegetative desiccation tolerance re-evolved in a subset of vascular plants that are located in extremely arid or water limited habitats. And it's thought to have re-evolved convergently through the rewiring of ancestral pathways that were maintained in seeds. In contrast, desiccation tolerance was maintained in many bryophytes and other early diverging lineages. And that this is thought to be a consequence of the fact that bryophytes lack some other adaptations or structures for water transport and retention, such as stomata and vasculature. And therefore, it was more necessary to maintain desiccation tolerance. So because of this evolutionary history, or as a result, we end up with a distribution of extant or living desiccation tolerant species that looks like this. So what I'm showing you here, let me use my pointer, is the land plant phylogeny at the family level, starting with bryophytes, ferns and fern allies, and then angiosperms in green. Every family that's written on here in blue, which I know you can't read, um, has at least one desiccation tolerant species in it that has been described. So there's probably many more that we haven't even described. Um, but what I hope you can appreciate from this figure is that desiccation tolerance is really common among the early diverging lineages of bryophytes and to some extent ferns and fern allies. But by the time we get to angiosperms, desiccation tolerance is only found in nine, arguably 10 uh, families of angiosperms. And they're really quite uh, distantly related. So it's thought to have re-evolved convergently in these lineages, possibly by rewiring similar pathways that were maintained in seeds. So we think this is a really exciting opportunity to study the convergent evolution of a complex trait. And by doing this, one of our goals is to identify, oops, sorry, identify some of the uh, core mechanisms that might be retained or shared across these diverse lineages. So I just wanted to give an example of what this diversity looks like. I think these pictures help drive home the message. So what I'm showing you here are uh, three different species of resurrection plants. We have a liverwort, a uh, Rickia opihandra, a dicot, Lindernelia puchella, and a monocot, Xerophyta humulus. These plants are separated by nearly 500 million years of evolution, yet we can find them growing in these closely intertwined communities in the same habitat and responding to the stress of drying in a very similar way. So all of these species can dry down to about 10% relative water content, and yet they all recover really beautifully within about 24 to 48 hours of rewetting. So as I said, we wanted to take advantage of this system to try to understand or identify some of the core or shared mechanisms of this trait. So Initially, we thought we could do this by taking advantage of publicly available uh, sequencing data. Uh, so there's been quite a lot of sequencing projects on all sorts of plants, including resurrection plants. And so we went out and combed through NCBI to find all of the RNA-seq data sets of resurrection plants that had been sampled you know, as they dried and then recovered. Uh, we were able to gather data for about 18 different desiccation tolerant taxa, um, we don't have perfect phylogenetic representation, but we did span from bryophytes to ferns to angiosperms. 
I really won't bore you with the details, but we did a bunch of bioinformatic analysis to identify orthologous genes and summarize the patterns of expression across this data set. And really simply put, what we found was that there was no pattern at all related to desiccation in these species. We found that, so this plot is just a PCA of gene expression and they're colored by species. Um, and what you're looking at here is every single species clustered in its own unique cluster, regardless of its hydration status. So we thought, oh, what is going on here? I mean, maybe each one of these species really does have a unique mechanism for surviving desiccation. However, we don't suspect this is true because we know from physiological studies that there are shared responses that have to happen to survive desiccation. So um, I won't go into the molecular details, but there are a number of processes that we know are necessary for survival of desiccation. So an alternative explanation to this pattern we're observing is that um, each one of these studies was collected by a different lab, a different researcher in a different year. And people tend to impose drought stresses in different ways and sample it different ways. So we thought we might be picking up on experimental variation uh, in these public data. And we really couldn't find a way to differentiate between whether or not this was experimental variation or, or true biology, biological differences between these species. So we actually abandoned this project completely and decided that the solution was to develop what we would call, and maybe this is a kind of arrogant way to say it, but a gold standard data set that could minimize variation between researchers and labs. And a data set like this could be generated by sampling all of this diversity in a single experiment. And it's sort of no surprise, but it turned out we were really well poised to generate such a data set. So at this point, I had been working in South Africa for a couple of years. I'd been working on single species projects, but I had observed at one of my field sites that there were um, a dozen or more diverse resurrection plants, and this is just a, a selection of them, that could be found growing in really close proximity to one another. And we thought, okay, this is a cool opportunity. We can go to the field and collect samples from these diverse plants in a common environment under common uh, conditions. And so this is a, a really large project that I've been working on over um, the past year or so. So last year, I went to this field site and I'm just showing you some preliminary data here. So we, I should say I actually, um, <laughs> collected these time courses for each of these 16 species in the field. So I basically went out to the field when the plants were in the hydrated condition and started collecting tissue and physiological data for them over the course of two weeks. They dried down and then I just sat around and waited for it to rain. And as soon as it rained, we ran back out to the field and started collecting the rehydration time points. And so what I'm showing you here, this is just the uh, physiological data showing the relative water content in red and the photosynthetic efficiency or FVFM in blue over the, the two week time course. And um, what I hope you can see is that pretty much all of these species dehydrated to very low relative water content, photosynthesis shuts down almost completely, and yet they all recover uh, within a few days of rainfall. Now we see different kinetics of how quickly they dry or how quickly they recover, um, but we think we've collected um, a pretty inclusive uh, and, and comprehensive uh, set of data for these plants. Now, this is as far as I've got on this project so far. What we're doing now is we've collected tissue for each of these time points in each of these species, and we're targeting like a massive transcriptomic and metabolomic study for all of these. And we hope that this data set will allow us to answer that question and see if there are there any core mechanisms that are shared across this large phylogenetic distance? Or do we see different mechanisms in bryophytes versus angiosperms, which has been hypothesized? So I'm excited about this data set. I hope you are too. And like, please follow up in a couple of years and uh, see what we find. In the meantime, we've been trying to ask a similar question, but on a more narrow phylogenetic scale. So we've been working with three different resurrection grasses. These are all native to Southern Africa. 
And as I said, these species are more related, but they are separated by about 10 to 20 million years of evolution. And they're all in different genuses. So we have um, Tripogon minimus, Microfloa caffra, and Oropetium capense. And all three of these species are resurrection plants and they're desiccation tolerant. And they're also really nice to work with. They're grasses, they produce a lot of seed and we can grow them up in just a few months and, and replicate them and conduct experiments on them. So what we did for this project, um, again, the goal here was to try to test if there were shared mechanisms between these grasses. So the first thing we did was we generated genome assemblies for these three species. Um, we use only long read pack bio data. And for uh, Tripogon and Oropetium, we were able to generate um, nearly chromosome level uh, assemblies, but these species have relatively small genomes and they're diploid. For Microcloa, um, it's hexaploid and it has a much larger genome. And so we were not able to get to chromosome level but we do still cover most of the gene space with this assembly. We then uh, collected these drying time courses, similar to what I showed you in the field. But in this case, these were done using replicated sets of plants in a growth chamber. And so we drive them down um, over the course of two weeks and rehydrated. And what I'm showing you here again is the same data on relative water content and photosynthetic efficiency. So, they all dried, they stopped photosynthesizing, and they recovered. We collected um, RNA-seq data for each of these time points. And if we just plot sort of a basic PCA of gene expression for each of the species individually, we see a pretty nice um, separation of samples. So in general, hydrated samples tend to cluster together. The dry samples form another cluster, and rehydrated samples form a third cluster. So we think we had a pretty good quality data sets. And um, so the next step was to actually ask our question, are there shared mechanisms here? Uh, in order to do that, we identified all of the syntenic orthologs between these species. And we then plotted the same kind of PCA of gene expression based on the syntenic orthologs or the genes that were shared among the species. And what I'm showing you here is the same plot colored two ways. In the bottom, it's colored by the species identity. And what I hope you can see here is that the species are really kind of mixed together. In the top plot, um, the samples are instead colored by water content. And what I hope you can see here is that we do sort of see a signal of like hydrated plant, uh, plants in one section and more of the dehydrated plants forming another cluster. It's a little bit messy. Um, but this encouraged us to think, okay, there, there seems to be a consistent signal of dehydration across these uh, three species. So as you do, the next thing we did was look at differential expressed genes. And um, what I'm showing you here is just the number of genes that were differentially expressed in the three species in uh, dehydration and rehydration. So we have upregulated genes and downregulated genes. I just want to make a couple points with this plot. So, Dehydration induces major changes in gene expression. We see thousands of genes that are upregulated and downregulated in these species. It's a quarter to a third of the genome is differentially expressed during this time course. In general, the genes that were upregulated during dehydration are then downregulated during rehydration and vice versa. So what goes up comes down and we return to homeostasis. <laughs> If we look at the patterns across the species, oh, why can't you see that? I'm marking here. There we go. Okay. We find, sorry, that's a bit hard to see. I know you guys can't see the numbers, but what I'm showing you here is the overlap uh, as a Venn diagram between the differentially expressed genes in the three species. And you, I don't think you can read those numbers, but we find about 25 to 20 percent of these genes are shared or differentially upregulated in all three species. We then looked at um, keg annotations, which is a more general way to look at the metabolic function or the predicted metabolic function of these genes. And if we look at the same plot of overlap between keg terms 
we find even higher conservation going from about 40% to 35%. So this suggests a couple of things. I mean, one, there's quite a bit of shared gene expression. Two, we find more shared uh, processes at a metabolic level than at a single gene level, which we might expect. So if you have sort of a slightly different uh, gene, but you still wanna arrive at the same end goal. Um, I don't think I really need to talk too much about this heat map, but this is just a clustering of the differentially expressed keg terms. And what I'd like to point out here is that these are, it falls out in these nice clusters of these are all the genes that are upregulated during rehydration in the three species. And these are downregulated during dehydration and vice versa. So we really are seeing evidence that there are shared patterns across these three grasses. We try to dig into what those shared processes are. That seemed like the next logical step. And so to do that, we conducted a gene ontology enrichment analysis. So what I'm showing you here is just a cluster of the enriched gene ontology terms in the different conditions in different species. And what you see is we find these like pretty distinct clusters of these are the genes that are up during dehydration and down during rehydration in the three species, and these are the ones that are up during rehydration. We can dig into what those functions are. And um, yeah, sorry, can't see that, huh? Um, okay, but I'll just tell you anyway. So these are the uh, shared enriched GO terms across the three species during dehydration, and the processes that we see coming up are in fact the hallmarks of desiccation tolerance. So we see major modifications to carbohydrate metabolism to favor the production and accumulation of small non-reducing sugars that function to form glasses and stabilize the cellular environment in a dry state. We also see major upregulation of antioxidant systems to deal with free radicals that are created during uh, partially hydrated sy systems and from photooxidative damage. We see other modifications to transcription and translation, as well as cellular organization during this time. During rehydration, again, we see many of the processes that we would expect to see in recovery from desiccation. So we see the resumption of photosynthesis and pigment biosynthesis to repair damaged chlorophyll and protein modification to um, repair and recycle damaged proteins. So not only are a lot of genes shared uh, across these species, but they also represent the hallmarks of desiccation tolerance, which we expect to see. Um, we did a whole bunch of other analyses that I'm not gonna talk about at all, just to say that we found really similar patterns. So we looked at co-expressed genes and the overlap between the co-expressed modules. We looked at uh, we conducted topological data analysis to understand the sort of underlying shape of the data. And in all of these cases, we find a stronger signal of stress than of species identity. So the overwhelming pattern in this data set is that stress is predictive of gene expression above and beyond species identity. So just to summarize this section of the talk, um, I'm running short on time. I've told you that desiccation induces major changes in gene expression. Dehydration and rehydration processes are largely inverse, although there are some specific things. So what goes up comes down and vice versa. We see high overlap between these species and it's even higher if you look at a metabolic level uh, versus a, a single gene level. The shared processes are the hallmarks of desiccation tolerance. And I don't think I mentioned this, but we see higher overlap in general during dehydration than during rehydration. And the explanation for this, or my idea for an explanation for this, is that desiccation stress is really intense and kind of overwhelming. And uh, the plants will divert almost all of their attention to dealing with this stress of desiccation. During rehydration, they might start to resume species specific functions related to reproduction or other processes. And that could explain uh, the higher overlap during desiccation compared to dehydration. So 
overall, we think there's evidence to say that there is a set of core mechanisms that are shared, at least among these grasses. And future studies will hopefully allow us to tell if they're shared more broadly across a, a, a larger phylogenetic scale. Yeah, okay. So I might buzz through this section pretty quickly, but I have a little bit more to say about desiccation tolerance before we talk about uh, representation and equity. So one of my other approaches to trying to understand the mechanism of desiccation tolerance is to narrow down a whole lot. So I just told you about these sort of broad sweeping analyses looking across um, huge phylogenetic distances. That's great for identifying deeply conserved processes. But we're also interested in identifying single genes or traits that can enhance tolerance. And so for this, uh, I've been working on identifying locally adapted populations or populations that show natural variation in desiccation tolerance. And we can then hone in to see what are the underlying traits that are driving this variation. This is a concept or an approach that I've been thinking about for, for a very long time. So as Margaret mentioned, my PhD work was on Marcantia and Flexa, a liverwort, and we looked at natural variation in this system. And then the first two years of my postdoc work were devoted to this really amazing species, Myrothamnus flavifolia, where I'd hoped to ask some of the same questions. Um, as it turned out, Myrothamnus was not a great system for this. So it is widely distributed, but it's a woody, uh, slow growing plant, and we were unable to propagate it clonally. So I couldn't generate replicates and I couldn't bring it into culture in the lab. So it turned out to not be a very tractable uh, system for this, but it is still a really amazing plant. Um, it has a lot of cultural importance and medicinal applications. Um, and we did put out a small study on the ecology of this species. But as I was working on my rathamnus, I stumbled across microchloa, one of the grasses I mentioned previously. And microchloa had really obvious phenotypic variation across the sites I was looking in. And so I thought, geez, maybe this is just um, the world's way of showing me this is the species I should be working on. And so we started trying to ask these questions in microchloa. The general approach for all of these studies was really similar. The idea was to screen natural populations to see if they had differences in their ability to recover from desiccation, and then to try to associate these with other uh, traits from life history to physiology to genetics. So as I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work in microchloa. Um, this work is supported by uh, Wally, the Water and Life Institute, so I should acknowledge them. Uh, thank you. And um, what I've done so far with this species is to, the idea was to generate a small, like a mini diversity panel. Well, I mean, really, we like a large diversity panel, but it's just me, and it takes time to, to make these collections. So. I've started out um, and have sampled 11 populations across an environmental gradient in South Africa. And the sites range from these low elevation, hot, dry sites to much higher elevation, cooler, wetter sites. Um, the sites are about 500 kilometers in distance, um, a couple, maybe 500 um, meters in elevation, and significant differences in rainfall. So we collected plants from all of these sites and we phenotyped them both in the field and we phenotype progeny in a common environment. Um, we measured a bunch of traits and we found a bunch of differences. So we first looked at sort of basic morphology. Um, I'll walk you through these really quick. So this is panicle length. So the length of the, the seed or flower, I guess, in fluorescence. Um, we find that plants from the hot dry sites, which are generally in these oranger colors, uh, had much larger panicles than plants from the wet sites. They also had much longer and wider leaves, but they produced far fewer panicles. So the plants from the wet site were very reproductive, but they were much smaller and bushier. I think the most interesting piece of evidence that we have of differences between these sites is that the the plants from these uh, hot and dry sites had nearly double the size of their genomes compared to the high elevation sites. So the high elevation sites, these are already hexaploid. This was the one we did the genome assembly on. 
But these plants from the hot dry sites are up to maybe dodecaploid. We haven't actually done the karyotyping, but just based on genome size, you have massive genomes. And, um, and people often like to ask, are these even the same species? Well, I don't even know what a species is anymore. Uh, but if we submit these to the herbarium, they come back with the same species identity. And um, you know, as we work up the genetics, we might be able to tell more about genetic divergence and, and wave our hands about the species. Um, so we have some interesting uh, phenotypic differences. Uh, we then wanted to characterize differences in desiccation tolerance. Uh, so what we did is we dried down all the plants and we and we measured their recovery. Um, this is just their photosynthesis, and, and this is just here to show that all the plants dried and they all recovered. And these are visual representations. So all of the plants recovered, but they recovered to a different degree. So we measured the uh, proportion of tissue that recovered in each of these accessions after dehydration. So we always lose some tissue to senescence during a desiccation event. Uh, but that amount can vary. And um, I'm going to show a video that I think helps to drive home this point. So this is the large ecotype from the hot and dry sites. This is the small um, ecotype from the wet, cool sites. And what I hope these are over the same time scale, what I hope you can see is that this larger ecotype is uh, recovering a lot more. It's greening up a lot more than this other one. And we, we do find significant differences in the proportion of tissue that recovers. So this was pretty exciting for me. And taken together, we describe two ecotypes of the species. So we have a high elevation ecotype that is characterized by small plants with lower ploidy, lower recovery from desiccation, but increased reproduction. And we have this hot, dry ecotype which there's some evidence of local adaptation here, right? Because they're recovering better from desiccation in the sites that are drier. And this is also so associated with higher ploidy and reduced reproduction. Now I could spend another 15 minutes talking about the potential trade-offs and the mechanisms that might be behind this, but I think for the sake of time, I'll save that for the questions. Um, and just summarize this section by saying, desiccation tolerance is still evolving. And we have evidence uh, or preliminary evidence that there are locally adapted populations that exist across this environmental gradient of aridity. And that these are associated with changes in ploidy. Now we can't say ploidy is driving increased desiccation tolerance. It's a complex three-way interaction, but it's possible that polyploidy and genome duplication might enhance existing desiccation tolerance mechanisms by either providing higher a copy number of important endpoint metabolites, or possibly allowing new copies of these genes to be neo-functionalized into protective functions. Okay. So, oh yeah, I wanted to say one more thing about my work on resurrection plants. So this has been a really um, fun and exciting opportunity for me to combine my longtime hobby of rock climbing with my research on plant science. Uh, resurrection plants tend to grow on vertical cliff sides, and so I've been able to use my, my rope access skills to abseil over these cliffs and make collections and, of plants that really haven't been studied very much before. And um, yeah, so this is whatever. It's been fun for me, but I also think it's one of the aspects about research and academia that I really appreciate. Um, is that this career sort of allows us the space to creatively combine some of our unique skills and do things that you know other people might not think to do or companies might not support us to do and and so this is just an example of, of why i personally um, love academia and and i just think it it provides a lot of opportunities for creativity okay so with that uh, I think I have maybe like 10 minutes or so. 15. All right. I'm going to shift gears completely. And um, I want to talk about this other aspect of my work, which has been focused on um, identifying and describing some of the persistent inequities that exist in, in our field of plant science. But I suspect these are, are sort of broadly um, true across other scientific disciplines. Uh, so this work is. 
Oh, how can I say it? Um, this work is more personal to me, and it was really born out of the time that I've spent uh, working in South Africa, working with the amazing biodiversity there and the brilliant scientists. And um, the, some of the observations that I was picking up on in terms of, to me, what seemed like really striking differences in in access to resources and facilities and opportunities uh, between uh, my work at Michigan State and the work in, in Cape Town. And I wanted to put, I wanted to test if these observations were, were real and put some data behind, behind these observations and test if, if these inequities did exist and if so, what were the implications of them? Uh, you know, and I also had spent a lot of time reflecting about what it meant to be a scientist coming from the United States, studying biodiversity in Southern Africa, which is a history that has a long and, and complicated and difficult history of colonialism. And how can I do this work ethically? Um, and so, yes, all of these thoughts were swirling around in my head and then COVID happened. And I thought, wow, okay, this is an opportunity to explore some other questions. And so, as Margaret said, over the past couple of years, we've, we've conducted a couple of sort of medium to large scale meta analyses to try to quantify the patterns and the progress and the inequities in plant science over the past 20 years. So I don't have time to talk about both of these studies, but they were similar in their thrust and many of the conclusions were really similar across both of these. So, the first study, which I'm not going to talk about today, we surveyed um, all of the species that had their genomes assembled, and we looked at who was doing that research and what species had been sequenced. And we found some pretty striking um, inequities, both in terms of human participation as well as taxonomic representation. Okay, this is in intriguing, but can we see how broad this pattern is? Let's scale up and look across uh, plant science more broadly. So we then set out to uh, survey about 300,000 papers that were published in plant science over the past 20 years. We sourced these from a range of journals, um, about 125 plant science journals, spanning impact factors and subject areas, and to the best of our ability, um, national locations. But there's even a bias there. And um, maybe I don't even need to say this, but this data set is not comprehensive. Um, but we do think it's representative of what the plant science literature uh, looks like. Okay, so the first thing we wanted to do is just look at the distribution of where plant science authors are based. And what we found is that plant science authors are largely concentrated in these three main regions of the world, in the United States, in Central and Western Europe, and in China. There are you know, noteworthy contributions from um, other regions of the world, but there are also large swaths of the globe that have a very small or reduced footprint in the plant science literature. We found that the patterns of where plant science papers are produced and published are really tightly correlated with national GDP and national research and development expenditure. So in general, wealthier countries tend to invest more in research and development, and this leads to more publications. Now, there are some, I think, interesting case studies of nations that are publishing either far more or far less than would be predicted based on their investment. And these are um, intriguing case studies to follow up on and see what's what are the factors at play in these nations that are either promoting or discouraging publishing in plant science. Now, Certainly research and development expenditure outputs may be found in other sectors in some of these other countries that are not even um, scientific or academic, but in terms of um, uh, companies and industry. Uh, but in general, we see that affluence is highly correlated with publication rates in plant science. And uh, just as sort of a side point, maybe this is obvious to say, but um, global affluence is one, not equal, and two, has been largely uh, determined by uh, our colonial history, which has led to the consolidation of wealth and prestige 
and scientific resources in select locations of the world. And it seems that this is uh, having an effect on, on where plant science research is being done. We also looked at how these patterns scaled with population density. So in general, you would expect to see um, increased productivity uh, in any field with increased uh, population density. And this is what we see across the globe. In general, like more populous areas produce more plant science papers. Um, however, there are a number of locations that fall either above or below that global mean. So the, the dots here in green are locations where uh, we're publishing a lot more papers than expected based on the population density. And, and pink is the inverse. So these are really populous areas that are not publishing a ton of papers. Um, so what I'd like to point out here is that this skews the, the situation even further. So we already were producing a lot of papers in America, but they're also coming out of very rural regions. Um, same in Australia and parts of, of Northern Europe. Now, I think this makes sense for plant science. Uh, in some sense, plant science is, is almost inherently linked to natural spaces and rural areas and more agricultural spaces. And, and in the United States, you know, we have a lot of land grant institutes in, in rural areas that are publishing a lot of papers in plant science. Um, but it's maybe it's noteworthy or problematic because the United States and Europe together account for less than 10% of the global rural population. And yet like 64, 65% of the plant science papers are published out of these regions. So this, I think contributes to the exclusion of rural people's perspectives from other regions of the world. And, and maybe this is a good point to say um, why I think that's a problem. Um, I think we can all probably come up with a lot of reasons why this is a problem, but I will just highlight two here. Um, one, by not including the voices of peoples from these other regions of the world, we are missing out on their expertise and wisdom. Secondly, if the science is being done and led by people in select regions of the world, we're almost certainly prioritizing the things that matter to us in those regions of the world. And they may be different from the priorities of people living in some of these underrepresented regions of the world. And so if we want to uh, really create an inclusive and well-rounded global science landscape, I think it would behoove us to try to include some more of these voices and perspectives from other parts of the world. So we actually thought, well, maybe this is happening. Maybe there is a really, oh, I'm jumping ahead. Um, this is just a depressing stat, but we also looked at citation rates across these data sets, and we found that um, citation rates have, are sort of random. They've increased a bit, and they're, they're a bit noisy. But in general, authors from North America, from China, and from Europe, and Oceania are cited nearly twice as much as authors from um, other parts of the global south. So I don't, I don't know, I think this is kind of depressing because we as individuals are the ones who are making choices about what we cite. And uh, maybe we're just citing the people that we know um, and are aware of their work. Uh, but I think we could probably do more to try to cite authors from other regions of the world as a way to um, amplify those voices. So yeah, we thought maybe the voices of people from underrepresented parts of the world were being engaged through collaboration networks, uh, but in fact, this is not the case. International and intercontinental collaborations were extremely uncommon in this database. So 70% of the papers were written by authors from just a single nation. Now, many of these papers include five, 10, 15 authors, but they were all from the same nation. And but 22% involved two nations and 5% uh, involved uh, three or more nations. So there's an opportunity to um, diversify our collaboration networks. And, and this is not to say or to diminish the work of anybody um, in science or in this room who's been working really hard to develop international collaborations and inclusive science. I, I know that it's happening. Um, on an individual level, but across the whole field, the pattern is um, really dominated by some specific regions of the world and that they tend to be a bit more insular. 
We also looked at gender dynamics. So we were interested to see if there was gender inequity in plant science publishing. In order to do this, we had to use an imperfect method of inferring authors' identity based on their first name. So these gender inference algorithms uh, don't always get it right, and they almost certainly misidentify anybody that's non-binary or gender non-conforming. And so um, maybe I don't need to say all of this, but we don't presume to know the true identity of any of the authors. But across this entire data set of 300,000 papers, and not just 300,000 papers, so it's also like 900,000 authors or more, we think that these patterns are probably illustrative. In general, um, authors with, what do we call it, names normatively associated with masculinity publish nearly twice as many papers as authors with uh, names associated with femininity. We do see some regional differences in how these gender ratios uh, exist. So authors from uh, there are parts of the world like Latin America and Eastern Europe that have more a female participation, but most of the regions of the world that are really publishing a lot of plant science papers are, are still quite male biased. Similar to continental differences, we also see that male authors tend to be cited more than female authors, despite publishing in similar impact factor of both journals. And, and finally, so gender, am I? I uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> gender ratios have increased some over time, but not as much as we could. They still lag well below 50%. Um, I know you guys are all dying to see this part about which plants are most studied. So we looked to see, yeah, no surprises, right? Um, Arabidopsis thaliana is studied in four times as many studies as, as the next most common species, wheat followed by maize. You have to go well below the top 50 before you find anything that's not a model or a major crop species. And um, we also looked at statistical over and under representation of studies on different orders of land plants. Um, and we find that there's a real overrepresentation of economically and agriculturally important plants and an underrepresentation of wild and biodiverse plants. Um, this is not to say that studying crops is a bad thing. It's led to a lot of um, agricultural innovations and scientific breakthroughs, but it may have come at the cost of exploring some of these more biodiverse species, which are threatened by extinction and also have a lot of really amazing secondary chemistry that could be mined for human activities. If we look across different nations, we see that there's actually a really different prioritization of study organisms in. So a lot of these nations that are leading plant science are following the same pattern of studying Arabidopsis followed by major crops. We get down to some of these nations that have a smaller footprint in plant science, we see a different prioritization of study species. And so this suggests that if we could broaden participation at a human level, we might see natural diversification of study systems and scientific questions. I'm going to skip the take home messages because we are out of time and I'm going to talk about this slide really briefly and then we'll just go to questions if there's time. So I always want to end my talks with an acknowledgement of the many quote unquote failures or setbacks that I've had in my career. Um, I think that this is a normal process of doing science when you're asking questions and trying techniques that have never been done before. There are some things that just don't work. And understanding that this is part of the project and it's not um, a personal failure, it doesn't mean you're a bad scientist, um, I think is worth doing. Uh, so if you're in this room and you're struggling with, with your science and things aren't working, uh, just know that I've experienced a lot of setbacks and I imagine almost everybody else in this room has and have learned a ton from all of them. Um, so with that, um, I'm starting my own lab next year at University of Illinois. If anybody's uh, interested or know somebody that might want to join, we're going to keep working on all the stuff I talked about today. And um, yeah, with that, I'll just I'll just say a lot of people helped me do this work. I didn't do it alone. Um, sorry for running over time, and I'd be happy to take questions if there's time. Yes and no. So some of the species are amenable to growing in the lab. The grasses have been great because they produce a lot of seed and we could easily germinate them. Other species have been really hard to bring into cultivation. Um, they're bigger plants, they're harder to grow from seed. Uh, there's also an, 
a technical, logistical, and ethical consideration because these are South African species. So I have tried to, um, where I could, study them in the field. Where I couldn't do that, bring them into culture in the greenhouse at the University of Cape Town with my collaborators. And when we couldn't do that, bring them back to the United States with uh, all sorts of like um, legal agreements about who owns the germplasm and whatnot. So if you're thinking about doing this, if you can find a species that you can bring into the lab, it really helps. It makes the science a lot easier. Um, but when in doubt, you can do these experiments in the field. Um, we have we just go out there with a huge liquid nitrogen doer and all of our equipment and um, make our collections in the field, but the data is a bit noisier. <laughs> well, it depends on your question. We've been doing time courses um, because we want to see how things are changing as they dry and rehydrate. Um, and if you're comparing different species, you, can, you might get away with one time point. Yeah, I think it's really cool to do it in the natural environment. And we have one study that have collected field samples and done RNA seq on, and actually the data looks really good. Um, it's a logistically a little bit more difficult um, to get this stuff out there, and if the weather doesn't cooperate. So one season I spent like a month sitting there waiting for it to rain, and it never did. And so we brought out watering cans, and we, <laughs> you know, so it comes with its own challenges. Yeah. Who, who's manning the questions? Like, uh, looks like we grad students. Great. Yeah, so I had a similar question. So, uh, collaborating with uh, international uh, international collaborations, yeah. especially with uh, low income countries, middle income countries, which are also biodiversity based, many of them. Have you thought about or have there been conversations about these issues of bio piracy and uh, it's not just not yeah. willing to collaborate because of uh, fear of bio piracy by hmm. not just so yes, those issues exist and we've thought about them a lot and I could say quite a lot about it. Um, but the second part of the question, I have not had any resistance from my collaborators in South Africa. In fact, they are so excited when maybe this is just the people I'm working with, but they are really happy to share the species. And in, But the way I've approached it is we have tried to establish uh, legal agreements specifying that the germplasm and any potential um, commercial applications remain uh, the ownership under the ownership of the University of Cape Town. Uh, I mean, really, they should be under the ownership of the indigenous communities in those areas, but that's another question. Um, and we've also just tried to include uh, co-authorship and real participation from South African students and collaborators in these projects. Um, and where we can, we keep the germ plaza on that side. But there are some things that are just a lot easier to do at Michigan State than they are at um, Cape Town. And yeah, I mean, and, and the other thing is, the United States hasn't ratified Nagoya Protocol, so you can get away with just being a cowboy and doing this stuff. But we need to all like take that responsibility, I think, on ourselves and and really try to find collaborators and, and have those agreements. Did I answer your question? So I had a quick question about the uh, the RNC data that we were showing. For the genes that that were upregulated when you have. Uh, like while the plant is under desiccation yeah. um, conditions, um, what percentage of genes were actually like roughly were stress responsive compared to other biological processes? Like I'm just trying to understand whether it's all stress adaptation or there are actual mm -hmm. biological processes that are getting. Well, I mean, it's <laughs> what is stress responsive? It's very, <laughs> you don't know. It's very, <laughs> so. I, I'm not totally sure how to answer that question. If we look at like genotology terms where they've said this is a stress responsive thing or this is a um, carbohydrate metabolism thing, then we could say I would estimate that about of the DE genes, maybe 20, 30 percent of them are these stress responsive go terms. But I would argue that the modifications to carbohydrate metabolism and the cell wall modifications and the protein modifications, those, those are stress responses as well. Um, I would 
actually argue that almost everything that's upregulated during that time is is a stress response. But um, yeah, if you're like just wanting to know about antioxidants, or um, it, it would be a smaller proportion. I think we're a bit over time, so I'm gonna maybe only ten. Questions. Yeah. So uh, with the grass, this is super cool. yeah. Uh, for the stomata, the difference between all the grass species mm -hmm. that like that's a great question and it's not something we've looked at um so the only thing i can tell you about stomata and these resurrection grasses um well i think that's a great idea i would love to, to do it if you want to collaborate and you're a stomata expert um we do see that the resurrection grasses tend to dry really rapidly so they'll hold on to their water until about 70 to 80 percent then they dry extremely rapidly. And what we think the explanation for that is they actually open the stomata and rapidly expel water so as to avoid uh, time spent at these intermediate hydration statuses, which are um, really dangerous because metabolic reactions stop halfway through when you get toxic intermediates. Um, so I think there are probably some very interesting stomatal uh, dynamics at play. And I've, I wanted to measure stomatal conductance in the field last year, but um, it, I just didn't have the time. I need a field assistant. Um, so, yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.